Call the meeting to order. Can I have a mover and a seconder to call the meeting to order? Deputy Mayor Coughlin, Councilor Cabral, that the regular meeting of the Council of the Township of Springwater, February 5th, 2020, come to order at 6.30 p.m. All those in favor? Carried. Please stand for the singing of the National Anthem, led by Deputy Mayor Coughlin. Thank you. Council, is there any uh, pecuniary interest to declare this evening? Okay, there seem to be none. <coughs> I, item number four, I'd like to call on uh, Debbie Kisheshian and Martha Scott on behalf of Hospice Huronia for a delegation, please. No, you didn't. We just, I just called. I have had a beautiful uh, uh, tour through Springwater Township. <laughs> Unfortunately, it's dark, but it is beautiful. Thank you. Hello. Hi. Thank you very much. Uh, Mayor Allen, Deputy Mayor Coughlin, councillors, township staff, and members of the community. I am very honoured to be here today as the new Executive Director for Hospice Huronia along with my board chairwoman, Martha Scott, and we also have a contingent in the back there. Several of our board members have joined us as well. And we wanted to come tonight to say thank you for your ongoing support of our work and to also give you a bit of an update about our exciting happenings that are happening at Tompkins House over in Penetang. Um, you, as I said, have been wonderful supporters. And uh, we wanted to let you know a little bit about what's happening right now with end of life care in our community. So we know that most people want to be in their own homes. They want to be in their own beds with their families surrounding them. The reality though is that 70% of us will die in a hospital. Um, for many, that means an eMERGE uh, with a little curtain wrapped around us and a lot of people around. Um, Right here in this community, a lot of our folks are very fortunate to be going to Hospice Simcoe in Barrie, a nice 10 bed residential hospice that has been a savior for a large part of your township. On April 6, things are gonna change a little bit as we add five new beds. Um, this is gonna offer private rooms, five more private rooms, Murphy beds, little bar fridges um, for residents where they can enjoy family life, they can pass their care over to our clinical care team. Our nursing staff will be there 24 seven, right outside the door to take care of all of their needs. And it will allow them to live with comfort and dignity no matter how long they have left. Where families can go back to being family again and allow our caregivers to take care of them. Uh, they can go out into our kitchen, get a hot bowl of soup, a cup of coffee, and the ear of one of our loving volunteers is there. And all of this is offered to them at no cost. Um, thankfully, because the Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care funds us at approximately 50% of our operating budget, and the rest comes from a very generous community. 
Um, the impact on the healthcare system is going to be great. We talk a lot about hallway, hallway healthcare. And uh, when you can free up beds in a hospital by bringing people who are at end of life into a residential hospice, it's a win for everyone. Um, a typical hospital bed with four people in the room uh, costs roughly $1,000 per day. A hospice bed is $460 a day. And then you factor in all that love and compassion and care that happens in our home. That's absolutely priceless. Um, Hospice Simcoe has been a supporter and has, as I said, with 10 beds taking care of this community, but they've been carrying a very heavy load. We've been very lucky that Executive Director Kelly Hubbard has also been sitting on our board and she's been helping us as, uh, to guide us as we open uh, and we plan to take our first resident on April 6th. Um, drywall's up. I was there today. It's very exciting and we will be sending each of you an invitation to come to our open house so you can see for yourselves. Yes, the majority of uh, the folks coming to us will be from your Ward, ward 1 area, um, but also know that we'll be supporting um, hospice care doesn't have geographic boundary lines. We'll work collaboratively with our partner hospice and make sure that people are in the right bed at the right time. Um, we're going to close out the entire circle of care for, for hospice care. So that means helping families in the home with our visiting program as we've been doing for over two decades now. Um, and right through to the grief and bereavement support that families need long after the death of their loved one. I'm just going to share a quick story with you about hospice care that's already been happening in your community. Um, a moment I'll never forget, uh, the good old Elmvale hockey rink. Um, I think it was 2002, my boy was playing hockey and uh, a young referee uh, died on the ice. Um, it's a day I won't forget and it's been a long time. Um, we now had a group of 14 to 16 year old boys in absolute uh, distress, right? Our, our uh, trainer was, uh, had tried to revive him and was unsuccessful. He carried a big burden. And the only thing I could think of was to reach out to hospice where my dad had died two years before. And uh, they sent over a volunteer and in my basement with some pizza, um, this lady came out and she was absolutely magical as she got these boys to talk and share about their experience. Um, each one of them not judged, just being able to say what they were feeling, um, say what they thought, and then they came up with a plan as to how they were going to honor uh, Brian English. And so at the next games, they all wore a black armband. And if you have any experience with 14 to 16 year old boys, um, you'll understand that this was a great feat that this wonderful lady, and to be honest with you, I can't remember her name, but I will never forget what she did for us. Hospice is quietly happening in our community. We are a hidden gem. But uh, whether it's the person coming to your staff to pay their tax bill or, um, uh, you know, the people in the community that you're going to meet, um, they may come and say to you, you know what, I'm struggling. I've just been diagnosed. Um, I'm thinking I might need to, you know, look at some hospice care. I want you to confidently think of hospice Huronia and uh, confidently tell them to pick up the phone and give us a call because we're there when they need them. Thank you. And if you have any questions at all, we'll be happy to answer. Thank you. Thank you very much for the presentation. Any certainly example, very touching. Um, can I have a mover and second to get this received? First of all, Councillor Cabral and Councillor Chapman. Um, <coughs> any uh, questions, comments? Thank you for the presentation. Thank you. The motion is that the delegation from <coughs> Debbie Keshen Kesheshian? Kesheshian. 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 Close. Bless you. <laughs> and Martha Scott, uh, on behalf of Hospice Huronia, be received. All those in favor? Carried. Thank you. Thank you again, ladies. Next, we move to question period, uh, where members of the public are invited to ask questions or make comments regarding an item on the agenda. Each person can speak to up to two minutes. May I ask come forward, please. Uh, excuse me, Mayor. Could I just make a comment uh, first, please? Uh, sure. We sure. have we have yeah, a number sir. of residents here tonight, and the way it reads on the um, agenda. It restricts the questions to um, the council items on the council agenda. That was never the original intent of question period, and I'm just wondering if we could clarify that if people have 
questions other than something on the agenda, it would also be acceptable for them to come forward. Okay, we have a procedures bylaw which we all reviewed and passed in 2017. And 8.37 refers to question period. And a, um, uh, in support of, uh, I'll read from an excerpt from that, in support of openness and transparency, questions that are intended or worded in such a way to solicit a decision resolution of council at the same meeting where the subject is not listed on the published agenda will be at the discretion of the chair. Um, such questions may be dealt with during items of future consideration or a future agenda and questions that are intended or worded in such a way to solicit a decision resolution of council at the same meeting where the subject matter is listed on the published agenda may be permitted. So the wording on the agenda is per that uh, section of the uh, procedural bylaw. And uh, so we discussed at the beginning of the term about um, adhering to that section of the procedures bylaw and I think that, that uh, that's worked well so far. I, I don't see there have been any problems. But with due respect, uh, Mayor, that's not exactly how the wording is on the agenda. The wording on the agenda restricts the questions to items on the agenda, but in the procedural bylaw, it doesn't state that it's restricted to that. It says that's they're at the discretion of the chair. You being the chair, when the questions come forward that are not uh, on the agenda, it's your discretion as to whether we can allow those questions or you can allow those chess questions. So rather than revising the procedural bylaw, I would just think tonight and in future, if we could just suggest that it'd be preferred if the questions were pertaining to items on the agenda, but we don't want to restrict our public, our taxpayers from being able to come here and ask questions because it says clearly in the, the procedural bylaw in support of openness and transparency and I would suggest restricting it just to items on the agenda is not consistent with the um, wording in this uh, uh, procedural bylaw. Um, well, what we could do, Councillor Hanna, is, is uh, make the wording more specific to the, uh, to the wording in the procedures bylaw. So for clarification, uh, could state that where the subject's not listed on the published agenda will be at, at the discretion of the chair. That could easily be added in the wording. Uh, thank you. I think in the future that might be appropriate, but I would suggest that unless the rest of the council disagrees that we should allow our taxpayers when they're here in their building in front of their council, if they have questions they want to ask, we shouldn't be restricting them. And I, guess I, I guess I have to uh, give the chair over to the rest of council to see if they agree with me or not. Well, this is uh, per the procedures, uh, procedure bylaw. I'm not, it's not being restricted. It's just at the discretion of the chair. Thank you, and I don't want to go on all night because I know we got a long night here, but it does say in the agenda that the, uh, regarding items on the agenda, and I'm suggesting that that wording restricts our taxpayers from being able to allow them to come forward and ask questions. Okay. As I just said, well, we'll put uh, an extra bit of wording in to make it more similar to the procedures bylaw. Thank you. Thank you. Questions, please. Come forward, please. You do, please, and address. Mrs. Yasmina Radosavljevic Shal Drake, 1060 Bayfield Street, Midhurst, Ontario, L9X012. My issue is regarding what you're going to pass tonight on Curry Motors uh, to the drainage system and uh, uh, LP. In October the 10th, 2014, Curry applied with Ontario Municipal Board for expansion of the property and units. At that time, County of Simcoe sent a letter to them stating that at this time they agree with your position not to do anything to the drainage. However, should Curry decides to put the units in or expand their property in any additional building, they will be required to hold uh, to ensure development for municipal water and sanitary system. And I wonder whether Curry would be held to that. Oh, and I do have the documentation, sir. Okay, um, our director of planning has, uh, has taken note of that. Uh, when it comes to that topic, um, he'll make a comment with respect to that. I guess my, my, I just wanna be assured that Curry does not get away with adding additional units and not having to put in septic tank and proper and not being attached to the sources, uh, 
township water. Okay. I'll get him to address that when we come to that topic. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. Next, please. Come forward. Name and address, please. Michael Bottom at uh, Ten Fred Boulevard. Welcome. Uh, thank you very much, uh, and um, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor and Councillors, for uh, uh, taking the time to uh, take the question, and also uh, actually for all the good work that you do. Uh, it goes uh, unsung heroes is the way I would describe it. So thank you. Um, I, I would like to speak on the uh, item on backyard chickens, and um, I think my question is is more general. Uh, than specific and uh, you know part of uh, uh, engaging in this debate uh, has led me to uh, read things like uh, strategic plans and look at what other people do and uh, reflect a little bit on why I uh, like living in uh, in spring water and um, that comes down to uh, uh, the ability to source local foods uh, fresh from the farmer and uh, that's currently uh, what we do whenever we can as a family um, getting our, our foods from local producers and, and um, what, what I would describe as the farm gate. Um, and that, I think, helps promote a healthy uh, community that I, that I like to live in. Um, it's interesting when I look at uh, the strategic plan for spring water and reflect on also on, uh, the 2013, uh, what's called the Local Food Act that was passed by the province of Ontario in 2013, which uh, basically encourages, um, and, and maybe that's, not strong enough a word, but encourages through legislation that municipalities take action to uh, promote local foods. And uh, when I look at the 2016 Spring Water Strategic Plan and also it's uh, in draft and also the 2018 uh, version, there's very little in there on promoting uh, uh, local foods. And uh, actually surprisingly little, um, which is what caused me to, uh, to want to come out and, and ask the question um, of, of all of you, of council, what is your intention with respect to uh, uh, promoting uh, local foods and embedding uh, initiatives to, uh, to promote uh, economic development and healthy living through uh, local foods? And I appreciate that the Backyard Chicken Initiative is, is in fact a big start in that direction. And again, thank you for challenge, uh, taking the challenge of dealing with that, because it's not an easy issue. It's, it's got a lot of complexity to it. But it represents, in my view, the st what should be the start of um, a, a wave of opportunity and development within spring water to promote uh, lo local foods. So uh, it's a bit of a, a backhanded way, uh, uh, Mr. Mayor, of saying I, I really strongly uh, advocate for backyard chickens. And, um, uh, and, and I put the emphasis on backyard as opposed to uh, acres of farmland, uh, but actually promoting uh, people to uh, develop gardens, develop uh, food sources that can be uh, uh, shared with their neighbors um, yeah, in, in many ways. So Kay. my question is, what other initiatives will council be doing? What will you be thinking about as you develop your strategic plan in, in, in terms of the 2013 Local Foods Act? Okay, thank you for the question. Um, we certainly do support local foods, uh, local food sources, agriculture, agritourism, in many different ways. Um, part of our exercise in 2020 will be to review the strategic plan and update that. Uh, Council will be doing that and uh, we'll certainly take, uh, take your comments and, and similar comments of others into consideration in doing that. I mean, we don't, uh, haven't um, stated clearly enough in, in our strategic plan potentially uh, what you reference to and what we are in fact doing, but don't have codified in the strategic plan adequately p possibly so thank you for that and uh, I know you'll stay for the chicken discussion which is going to be coming up after the after the uh, minutes shortly thank you very much thank you anybody else okay so we're moving on to 6.1 which is adoption of uh, minutes of council can I have a mover and seconder uh, Councillor Moore and Councillor Chapman, um, any uh, comments with respect to the minutes of the regular meeting of Council January 15th, 2020? All those in favour? Carried. Mover and seconder for the minutes of boards, committees and other, other organisations. Deputy Mayor Coughlin and Councillor Chapman. 
Any questions with respect to any of these minutes, one through five? The, that being the uh, uh, minutes of the library board meeting December 17, 2019. Minutes of Committee of Adjustments, October 23rd, 2019. The Midhurst Community Recreation Association meeting, December 2nd, 2019. The Joint Accessibility Advisory Committee, January 16, 2020. And the Heritage Advisory Committee, December 3rd, 2019. All those in favor? Carried. Okay, moving on to 8.1. Action report, which is, has options to it, and that is backyard chickens, public consultation, and summary, and options. Can I have a mover and a second to get this on the table? Councillor Chapman, Councillor Moore. <coughs> so, before we start into it, I'm going to turn it over to uh, planner Chris Russell to um, just start with a uh, summary of the report and, and uh, all the hard work that's gone into this thus far. Thank you, Mayor Allen, uh, Deputy Mayor and Council. Uh, for the benefit of the uh, public here tonight, my name is Chris Russell. I'm a planner here with the Township, and if you have an interest in chickens, I've probably talked to you over the past six months or so. Um, I do want to preface the discussion here tonight uh, by saying that I, I am not a statistician, a farmer, a disease pathologist, or a veterinarian. Uh, this process has been a learning experience for myself and the Township and the municipality in general. Uh, and I may not have every answer with respect to the individualized and specialized care that chickens require. Uh, that being said, the purpose of tonight's report is two part. Uh, the first is to su summarize the public consultation process that was undertaken with respect to backyard chickens. And secondly, is, uh, the second is to provide council with options to further direct the municipality with respect to backyard chicken permissions in spring water. And uh, to assist with these options, staff have prepared a number of guiding provisions which uh, Council will need to deliberate on and uh, which I'll expand on shortly. Uh, with respect to Part 1 of the report, uh, beginning in September 2019, Council directed that a public consultation process be undertaken to gather additional information and feedback uh, with respect to backyard chickens in spring water. The Township developed a survey which was available on the Township's website from t September 22nd to December 2nd of 2019, as well as available at the library locations and the Township Admin Centre. Uh, the Township received a total of 294 spring water residents uh, responses. Uh, this response is substantial and, and likely represents our most highly returned survey to date. Um, so thank you to the public who participated in that and who have an interest in this process and this topic. Uh, staff have included generalized findings of the survey within the staff report and the complete responses are found within Appendix A and B of the report. Additionally, Township staff held a public uh, open house on November 7th, 2019 to uh, uh, gather additional information and hold face-to-face -face discussions with residents, business owners, and those having an interest or, 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 or those in the um, uh, commercial farming business uh, res with respect to chickens. Uh, staff also reached out directly to the farming and agricultural communities uh, through discussions with the Simcoe County Federation of Agriculture and the Springwater Agricultural Advisory Committee. To summarize the findings of the public consultation process, uh, roughly 215 or, or 73 percent of survey respondents were in support of keeping uh, of the keeping of backyard chickens in spring water. Uh, support, was ch uh, support for chickens was lar largely based on wanting fresh eggs and uh, educational purposes uh, as the most common survey responses. In opposition, the agricultural community provided substantial concern with respect to backyard chickens impacting commercial flocks, animal welfare issues, attraction of predators, and the potential for transfer of disease to humans. Additionally, the remaining 27% of the survey respondents were in opposition for similar reasons. Township staff also spoke directly with the Simcoe Muskoka District Health Unit, which concluded that the risk of pathogen transfer to the human population was seen as relatively low, provided that excellent uh, maintenance and cleanliness provisions were incorporated into any final bylaw. Uh, and with respect to the second half of the, the report, uh, staff have prepared a number of options for Council's deliberation or Council's consideration. Option one would uh, continue the status quo prohibitions with respect to backyard chickens in spring water. Option two would direct staff to begin the preparations for a limited pilot project of up to three years through a, uh, by way of a temporary use bylaw. And option three would direct staff to begin preparations for a permanent and township-wide backyard chickens program. 
uh, should council wish to direct staff into either option two or three, council must provide some direction to staff with respect to a number of variable provisions. These include the minimum property size associated with backyard chickens, whether backyard chickens should be permitted within settlement areas, the, how many chickens are permitted per property, uh, the duration of a pilot program, if any, uh, the prohibition of the sale of products, the keeping of roosters, and the slaughter, or the home slaughter of, of, of animals. Uh, these guiding provisions are contained within the last page of my staff report. And um, I'll go on, but in addition to the guiding prevent, uh, provisions, uh, staff have been in discussions with uh, uh, various specialized poultry veterinarians regarding the uh, minimum standards that would be necessary to maintain a healthy flock of backyard chickens. Uh, should council wish to move forward with either, either option two or three, the following are some of the minimum standards staff would be recommending to council as part of any backyard chickens bylaw coming forward. These include animal welfare provisions, including uh, requirements for fresh water, adequate nutrients, feed, summertime ventilation, and wintertime heating or insulation, uh, coop cleanliness and manure disposal requirements, uh, coop security requirements, re uh, requirements for qualified veterinarian assistance, uh, spill and rodent proof food container requirements, source water pr protection requirements, and deceased animal and disposal requirements, um, as well as educational materials and, and, um, and, by and bylaw enforcement uh, considerations to deal with. I think at this time I'm happy to take any questions and I appreciate that. Thank you, Planner Russell. Okay, I'll open it up to Council to uh, start discussion. Councillor Ritchie? I'll give it a shot. Um, welcome, everyone. Um, I like the report. Uh, this has been ongoing for a while. Uh, there's people in the township doing it. Um, I support option two, um, so I'd like to start there. I like the pilot project of three years. So, <clears throat> I think the number of chickens has to do with the size of the lot. So we have an ordinary residential lot in town, and I'm using Elmvale. Um, so whatever that'll handle, if it's four or six. And then if it's three years, then it's given them enough time to build the proper facilities for it. So um, the number of chickens to the size and the three years. And I think those are all tied together. If, if we can find clarity with that, then we can move forward. And then after three years, um, bring back for a renewal and see how that works. I, I think that would be the best way to approach that. Um, cleanliness, uh, I, I think we've hit all the targets there. There's other municipalities in the province that's doing it. So... Um, and, and they're doing it now, uh, and that's the thing. Uh, if, we, if we say no and go with the status quo, they're going to continue on. So at least if we bring something out, then maybe they'll comply with the new rules and, and bring it in so that um, if, if the bylaw does go to inspect it, they've made improvements for the welfare of the animal. So that, that's one way of looking at that. And those are my suggestions. Thank you. Thank you. you. Councillor Cabral. Thank you, Mayor Allen. Um, Comment first, I want to thank the residents for uh, being uh, so uh, interested in this and uh, it took me a long time to read over the comments that were included in the report as an attachment and certainly the statistics that came from the online survey. Uh, it just goes to show that uh, people are out there and they're interested in what's going on and a lot of them had some uh, great comments that were uh, pro. Um, chickens and of course there were many residents that did have uh, concerns about some of the uh, detrimental um, aspects of uh, raising uh, fowl uh, in an urban area. Um, there have been many many um, other municipalities that have uh, actually engaged in pilot projects and some of them have uh, ongoing um, ongoing work with uh, the backyard chickens within their communities. I kind of see it almost as a step back kind of like going back to the future because uh, um, I've known people uh, when I was a kid that actually raised chickens in their backyard, whether or not they were doing it legally or whatever, I don't know. This is down in, in uh, East York in Toronto at the time and then again out in Pickering. But um, uh, they tended to look after them quite well and they did have the benefit of uh, fresh eggs in the morning and uh, the kids did have an opportunity to gain some experience looking after um, 
I'd have to say pets because sometimes I, I think maybe uh, the kids are going to see them as pets. Maybe they're allergic to fur and can't have a dog or a cat. Uh, maybe they, they're okay with, with the chickens. Um, but I, I did have uh, questions much along the same lines as uh, Councillor uh, Ritchie with respect to the number of chickens. Uh, basically, from uh, the survey, uh, four seemed to be the minimum that anybody was interested in, in, in keeping. And uh, some people were talking up upwards of, uh, of 10 to 20. Uh, 20. Uh, I would agree that maybe in uh, certain areas of the township, it would be more appropriate to limit them to four, certainly no roosters. Uh, uh, but uh, on maybe some uh, larger, uh, more rural properties in excess of an acre or two, maybe there could be a different number from, from, from that. Uh, but I did want to ask about the uh, educational materials that Simcoe County District uh, Health Board has offered to provide us because it gave me a sense that they've obviously been doing something along these lines with our neighboring communities for some time. So I was wondering if you could uh, provide any further uh, information on that. Lana Russell. Thank you, Marilyn. Um, through you to the rest of the council, as part of any future direction from council, the bylaw enforcement department will need to develop educational and outreach materials. Um, so b just basic handling, cleanliness, those types of materials, um, you know, best practices, coop dimensions, all of that will need to be determined and, and, and done through the bylaw enforcement department, uh, who will primarily be dealing with frontline calls uh, uh, when we do receive complaints regarding backyard chickens. I have received some materials from the health unit. I have received some materials from uh, specialized uh, veterinarians dealing with poultry. So there is a lot of material we do have already prepared for this, but it will um, uh, come out of the process as we move through it. The comments, councillors? <coughs> okay. Councillor Hanna? Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, I have the feeling that uh, option uh, two, the uh, pilot project, will probably be the one that council votes for. Um, if that is the case, there's a couple other questions to just to help staff. And by the way, I thought it was an excellent report from staff. A lot of good information there. As it was mentioned, a lot of reading. Um, what I thought was interesting, there was only 11% difference between the people who wanted chickens and didn't want chickens. That's pretty close to anything we've ever done in the past. I was surprised the number of people who uh, said they didn't want uh, chickens because normally when we have projects or requests go forward, we only hear mostly from the people who are supportive. So I was surprised that the people who weren't supportive actually got involved and speaked up and didn't wait until it was approved then complained. So I thought that was a positive thing from the survey. The, the um, pilot project, to being three years, it would not be in within this term of council when it came back. And I think that's a consideration we might want to talk about. Um, will the chickens will be kept in pens all the time or will they be allowed to uh, roam through the backyards or whatever? And the other issue I saw in the report was um, four foot from the, the uh, property line. Uh, I'm suggesting that somebody maybe with a million dollar home would not be happy with having a chicken coop four feet from the property line. So just other questions that we have to think about. Um, the other concern I have is that one of the important issues that I don't think is getting enough consideration is the possible consequence of the risk to our poultry industry. And we've all heard, I think, well, I know I've heard from several farmers and the different agricultural societies, the, the um, backyard chickens could, suggest that it could um, be a danger to our poultry industry. We have at least three major poultry uh, producers in, in our township. Um, the risk in endangering that industry by, by having hobbies or pets, as some people have described them, maybe needs more evaluation. And, and I think that's a concern that I have, is uh, not being in a position to support our agricultural society. And the other thing, too, that I would suggest that maybe um, speculation on liability and negligence that could be established by people having backyard chickens if they fail to uh, keep them in a sanitary or, or stop them from being infected. And as a result of those backyard chickens, it impacts our uh, poultry industry. Um, speculation on, on class lawsuits or, um, or just civil actions against the people that maybe were negligent and could be found liable. And if it did affect 
the poultry industry is other issues that uh, I have to uh, consider. Thank you. Um, certainly, um, I'm in favor of uh, the second option, but it's all dependent upon the, uh, the regulations. And, uh, and I know that Planner Russell has done a lot of research that, uh, um, that and more is needed to be done to be able to craft, if we do go forward with an option two, um, it needed to be uh, incorporated into uh, a bylaw just to take into concern the uh, take into account the concerns of the agricultural community that was expressed as, as stated in the report through the Simcoe County Federation of Agriculture and through uh, and through the uh, the OFA um, and the and the agricultural committee um, just just touching on Councillor Hannah's point with respect to vaccination maybe you could just summarize what uh, what you found out about that particular element. Thank you, Mayor Allen. Uh, again, through you to the rest of the council. Uh, f I, this may fall under something that staff needs to deal with and come back to council as part of a bylaw, but what I can share with council is through my re research, I have not seen uh, any provincial mandate or OMAFRA mandate to vaccinate backyard chickens as of right. Um, now, I've spoken with a number of uh, veterinarians who are, seem to concur with this, um, but again, I, I feel like there's more research to be done here and brought forward to Council as part of any implementing bylaw. Um, my suggestion would be at the very least, we require some, sorm, some form of uh, a veterinarian assistance um, before we uh, issue a chicken license to, um, to a resident. They, they ensure that they are uh, capable of maintaining a backyard chicken. Okay, Deputy Mayor Coughlin. Um, <clears throat> sorry, and uh, through you, Marilyn. Further to that, how, how is that different than, uh, to me that seems one step above a dog or other pets that are kept. So I, I've been following it and in total agreement with everything and, and I do, ag I am in full support of putting forward a pilot project. I do agree that there um, being a urban and rural municipality there should be some leeway on how many chickens based on lot size. I think that's a, a great initiative. Uh, but as far as the licensing and veterinary, I mean, we, we don't require, we don't go out to farms and, and see if they're cows or their chickens. Like, so if, if that's gonna be done for backyard chickens, are we gonna start visiting every farm that we have in the municipality? I, I feel like this could potentially, if we went forward with that type of regulation, open up, uh, something that maybe we don't want to be involved with. Lana Russell. Uh, through you again, uh, Mayor Allen. Um, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm not sure how to proceed here with this. It, it's it, very briefly, the way we deal with dogs and licensing dogs is you do require vaccinations for rabies and, and things like that before you can get a dog tag here at the township. So we, we do, in some sense, require that you consult with a veterinarian before you have a dog here in the township. Um, similarly speaking, the from what I understand through the veterinarian process is not all veterinarians deal with chickens or, or are capable, capable of caring for them. Um, so it, it may be that uh, they are fewer and farther between for veterinarian care for backyard chickens. Uh, it was si simply a suggestion that we may bring forward something along the lines that even a letter from a veterinarian that is capable of caring for a backyard chicken as part of uh, a licensing process. But again, from what I can tell online and through the research, there is no provincial mandate through MAFRA or the province to vaccinate backyard chickens. Councillor Moore. Thank you, Mayor Allen. Uh, so my point really is um, to state that I I do support option two. I do support the pilot project. Um, recognizing that our farming community has concerns, I'm also aware that they invest heavily in biosecurity, that their chickens don't go outside of, of their facilities, um, and they're strictly regulated. I think that vaccinating our chickens would be counter to the reason most people have chickens, um, and that is to have fresh, unaffected eggs. So I think that that would be counterintuitive. Um, so I just wanted to put that out there. The rural versus option or rural versus urban lot size, we have in my ward a lot of 
close-knit close, close -knit communities, uh, high-density communities, I, I think that that would be a disadvantage to not allow them. So the lot size, um, in, in my ward particularly, I'm, uh, I'm in favor of keeping it to um, unrestricted. So maybe the smaller lot sizes could have four chickens, larger lot sizes have six or eight. Um, that would be my, my opinion. Thanks. Councillor Chapman. Thank you, Mayor Allen. Um, just for the um, pilot project, I also support option two, and the report was um, a really good um, educational, all the, all the stuff that you've uh, found out. Would they apply for like a temporary project, pilot project, or can anyone, or is it just certain certain people within the town, not certain people, but how many people within the township, if we did 20, or is it anyone within the township that can apply for the project? project? Planner Russell. Uh, th three, Marilyn. Um, right now, I think that the um, position of staff is, is not to limit the number of properties that would be uh, available through the pilot project. Uh, I do know that uh, Aurelia did limit it to 12 specific properties. Uh, and my understanding through their discussions with their staff is only three of those properties came forward. So they may not get a, a, a good uh, test case through their pilot project. Whereas I think uh, opening up to the entirety of the township may be more appropriate here. Okay, so we've heard from each person. I think what we're doing tonight is just deciding on which direction to go with this and not getting into the specifics of the conditions. That would be the, the next stage. So unless, unless we have any further questions, I think we're ready to vote on option two. Councillor Cabral. Just wanted to make one comment. Um, one of the more recent uh, communities to take this up is Kingston. And I just wanted to make a comment that they get uh, 400 and some odd dog complaints. They only had 17 chicken complaints on their pilot. <laughs> I also wanted to say that uh, for a city of that size, even though they went with the, the, the pilot project, they only actually issued 30 permits. And only 23 of those permits have been active at any given time. So I just wanted to make that comment with respect to it. Councillor Hanna. Thank you. And, and just to reply to my friend at the other end of the table, I think there's probably a, a lot more dogs in the community there than there are chickens. So that might be the difference. Um, and I, I realize, as I said earlier, I, I believe option two is the one that this council will go forward with. Okay. I'm voting against the motion because I think somebody has to support our poultry industry. And, and I, I would be, be um, I'd be disappointed in myself for, for not at least considering the complaints or, or the requests from our poultry interest our farming community and so on and by not somebody not voting against this to support them I think is ignoring their concerns so I'll be voting against it and I'll ask for a recorded vote um, Councillor Han I would I would challenge that if you vote if you vote for this um, uh, that uh, you're voting against against the agriculture or poultry industry uh, as, as I said in, in my comments, uh, uh, we're very concerned with the, the issues pertaining to what they bring forward, and those would be taken care of or reviewed, certainly, in the, in the, in the bylaw conditions. So uh, um, uh, that's, uh, that's, we have to look at all of the issues. I don't agree that they've been uh, adequately covered to satisfy the poultry industry. Well, we're not at that stage yet. Again, uh, uh, proving backyard chickens, I think, is counter to what the agriculture committee is asking for. Okay. All right. So, uh, Councillor Ritchie. Thank you, Mayor Allen. I just wanted to comment. Uh, Deputy Mayor Coggle and I agree with what she was saying that about veterinarian assistance. I think by looking at the size of what we need, so to make sure they're safe and make sure that they're comfortable, and and size has a lot to do today, even in the commercial chicken industry, as to uh, um, to make sure they're looked after. So I, I think if we look at it in that regard, I think we, we've covered that veterinarian end of it um, and making sure the structure and the size and, and that is, is looked after. Um, I think it wouldn't hurt to know who's doing it so that if there is a complaint, they can come to us, we can have information to give to them to help them comply and bring it in to so that they're doing it right. Because keep in mind, there's people doing it now. 
and I don't hear of any any wild disease or anything like that so a lot of them are for pets a lot of them are for um, I don't agree with the slaughter I, I think if enough of them got together they might be able to go and talk to a farmer that does meat hens or something like that um, I know farmers that do they do the the minimum amount is 300 out of quota where they can take and get them processed and bring them back so there's that process as well too there's there's still lots of work but I think we've given you the direction of option two and I support that thank you okay can, can we go to a vote or is there something new that we're bringing forward I think it's very important to speak up on uh, Deputy Mayor Coughlin had her hand up and then I'll come to you if it suits, I had two points. One quickly was just going to be, I hope that when I was speaking to lot size that I feel that every <coughs> resident should have the opportunity to have a minimum of four and then per particularly more as the lots get bigger. And then I was going to ask to move uh, option two. Okay. Councillor Cabral. Thank you, Mary Ellen. I, I just, you know, there's folks at home that are watching this as well as the people that are here. And uh, I don't want uh, our farming community to feel that uh, they've been neglected or discounted. They certainly haven't been from where I'm sitting. Uh, I've spoken uh, to some of the farmers. Uh, I, I've listened to them. But I have to weigh what we're doing. And I think that by going to a pilot project, it's not discounting them. We're going to look at ways to mitigate any potential hazards and biosecurity through whatever regulations we put in place down the road. So I just want people to be clear. It's not that I'm 100% behind backyard chickens. It's just that I believe that at this stage of the game, it's worth going for a pilot project because I feel that we can mitigate those, uh, those conditions. Thank you. That's the point I was making as well. Um, so we have a mover and a seconder that the report from the senior planner regarding backyard chickens, public consultation, summary and options dated Feb 5, 220, be received, and then option two, pilot program, that staff be directed to undertake a limited backyard chicken pilot project through a temporary use zoning bylaw and the preparation of a licensing bylaw for council's consideration. And uh, a, a recorded vote was requested by Councillor <coughs> Hanna. <coughs> When I state your name, please state yes or no. Councillor Cabral? Yes. Councillor Hanna? No. Councillor Chapman? Yes. Councillor Moore? Yes. Councillor Ritchie? Yes. Deputy Mayor Coughlin? Yes. And Mayor Allen? Yes. That motion is carried. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, moving on to 9.1, other action reports. We have 9.2 through 9.11. Can I have a mover and a second to get them on the table, please? Councillor Chapman, Councillor Cabral. Um, items to be pulled, first of all, or just discussed? Councillor Ritchie. Mayor Allen, I'd like to pull uh, 9-7. I just want to speak to it for a minute, please. Okay. If, if, if you're just speaking to it, it, it doesn't need to be pulled. So you could just, uh, anybody like to pull an item? Councillor Cabral? 9.8, please. Okay, so um, 9.7, Councillor Ritchie. Um, in regards to the food bank, I've been a uh, very big supporter of that. I know they're, uh, we're going to be lending the money, and uh, I have no doubt in my mind at all that they're going to be able to repay that back and then some. Um, this here is such such a worthwhile project. It, to see, go and see uh, how they're running it now, you, you, have to, you have to ask yourself how they're doing it. So um, I, I support this. I know... Um, our community is going to get behind this, and then once this thing gets hits the road, there's going to be a lot of support. I'm going to, you'll see that just like we did with the high school. Once it got rolling, uh, everybody uh, got in on the bandwagon, and I have no reason uh, to think that they will, they will be able to pay this back and then some. And uh, 
we want to remember this is the last line of defense. This is food bank. They need our help, and we're help, here to help them. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I'll uh, read, the, uh, read the motion. That the uh, action item reports 9, 2 through 9, 11 be received, and that the recommendations contained therein be approved as presented. 9.2, final completion, center Vesper water and wastewater treatment plant phase 3. 9.3, Yorkwood Stone Manor Woods Development Securities Reduction. 9.4177801 Ontario Inc. Transfer Easement to the Township of Springwater. 9.5 Vigo Roman Catholic Cemetery Archdiocese Ownership Request. 9.6 Stop Up and Transfer Portion of Municipal Road Allowance Hauler Road Sale of Land. 9.7 Elmvale and District Food Bank Contract Award. <coughs> 9.9 .9, Springwater Meadows Gallo Servicing Allocation Request Phase 1B. 9.10 uh, ZB 2019 Alex Curry Motors. 9.11 2020 Public Holiday and Year End Holiday Office Closure with the exception of 9.8 to be dealt with separately. All those in favor? Carried unanimously. Okay, 9.8. That was Councillor Cabral. Thank you, Mayor Allen. Um, great report. Uh, sorry, before, we, can we get a sorry. mover and second to get oh. it on the table? Uh, Deputy Mayor Coughlin, Councillor Ritchie. <coughs> Go ahead. Thank you. I, uh, I just, uh, great report. Um, I, I know this is coming down the pipe, but one of the questions I, I wanted to know uh, after reading this over, and I know it's going to be a process, but I'm hoping that we can have a bit, a bit of enlightenment towards this is um, over the past little while there have been some uh, garden suites and things like that that we've uh, provided uh, temporary um, uh, permits to and I'm just curious um, at the end of this particular process uh, are we envisioning that uh, those particular ones if they're still within that temporary period of use would they be able to then apply do you envision them being able to apply um, this is through to uh, Director Spagnol, um, to uh, apply to uh, uh, create a garden suite based on what's already in place there. I just, that's the one question I had that I wanted to have answered. Director Spagnol. Thank you, Mayor Allen, through you to Councillor Cabral. I think there would be an opportunity for those existing units to come to the township and, and register and license those, those units and, and have them legalized under this program once it is finalized. So that would be something that, that we definitely consider as the process moves on for sure. Councillor Ritchie. Thank you, Mayor Allen, through the Director Spagnol. Uh, I like this report, well-written report. I support it 100%. This is a, uh, and, and you're, you're so right. We've seen how many people come over the last number of years looking for these, uh, uh, the, these allowances. Um, again, especially with the housing crisis that we're seeing here today and allowing people to get into uh, accommodations. One question that comes to mind, if somebody's building a new home and they go to pay their development charge, um, is there any, is, does the development charge increase because I'm going to put in that second suite downstairs or should I shut my mouth and not say any more because I want to build a house? But <laughs> hopefully the price stays the same. Uh, thank you, Mary Ellen, through to, to Council Ritchie. Uh, first of all, I'd like to take credit for the report, but Planner Lisk wrote the report, so she deserves to be commended on the, uh, the thoroughness of the report. Um, to try to, to answer uh, Councillor Ritchie's question, um, the development charges right now under Bill 108 are still trying to be figured out, so they haven't been finalized through the province at this point in time. So right now, development charges would be applicable to separate, detached, accessory residential units. Now, at building permit stage, as long as there's, there isn't any detached units being proposed at that point, that would not have an impact on the development charges. It's only upon the application of your building permit to actually build the second unit, the detached unit. Okay. The um, motion reads that the report from the planner dated February 5, 2020, regarding additional residential suites, uh, otherwise called second or secondary units be received and that staff be directed to initiate a township-led official plan amendment and zoning bylaw 
amendment process to permit additional residential units, second secondary suites outside of the official plan review process. All those in favor? Carried. Next, moving on to uh, information reports. Can I get a mover and second to get it on the table? Councillor Cabral, Councillor Moore. Are there any of these, one through 10? Councillor Hanna? I have a question on 10-3, please. 10-3, uh, Deputy Mayor Coughlin. Thank you, I have 10-5. Ten 10-5, five. Ten five. so Councillor Hanna, 10-3, uh, please. Uh, the 10-3 uh, is proposed changes to the Drainage Act. In that report, the uh, province or the ministry is seeking feedback by February the 18th. My question is, are we as a township providing any feedback? And uh, that would go to uh, Director Coleman. Uh, thank you, Mayor Allen, through you to Councillor Hannah. At this point, um, we are in favor of, I believe, most of the changes that they've uh, recommended. So we can provide feedback um, that way. And if there's anything that Council would like to add, then we could take those comments and add those as well. And 10.5. <coughs> Uh, thank you, Marilyn, and uh, through you to Director Spagnol. My apologies for not asking this earlier. The, the report being received is addressed to the Committee of Adjustment for the 20... So I'm, I'm just curious as to the process of having it at the Council table prior to it at the Committee's table. Director Spagnol. Thank you, Marilyn, through you to Deputy Mayor Coughlin. Just for clarification purposes, the question is why th would this report have to come to council prior to the meeting? Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you. In the past, um, there has been um, comments received from previous councils that as a council, there needs to be opportunity to provide maybe a council-oriented response to, th to applications that might have a township-wide implication or that might serve some more of a, of a, a township interest. So the idea was that the reports would be included as um, almost an information report for council's consideration to provide council as a council the opportunity to provide comment if council felt, uh, felt it was necessary. Okay, the motion is that the report items listed herein be received as information. The number one award of server infrastructure Two, drinking water inspection report, Snow Valley drinking water system. Three, proposed changes to the drainage act. Four, purchase of loader scales. Five, application B01 slash 20, boundary adjustment uh, pertaining to G Woods, 21 and 25 Young Street, North Elmville. Six, bylaw enforcement, December 219 activity summary. Seven, building department, December 219 monthly report. Eight, fire department, November 19, 219 monthly report. For, uh, number nine, fire department, December 2019 monthly report. Number 10, Rural Ontario Municipal Association conference review. All those in favor? Carried. Next, we move to item 11, uh, verbal reports. Director Spagnol, any official plan update or economic development updates? Thank you, Marilyn. The only, uh, the only update is similar to the last meeting uh, regarding the official plan review. A report will be forthcoming regarding the next steps for the official plan review and update process, uh, which uh, staff will be looking to, uh, to obtain authorization to initiate phase two of that project. I do not have uh, any updates regarding economic development uh, activities at this point. Thank you. Councillor Ritchie, question? Marilyn, I had a question to ask the director. Um, in regards to the official plan updates, when are we going to be having a, a workshop or where we can ask people to come and, and give their comments? I, I think that's, that's very, very important, and, and I, I get that asked to me. And could you uh, shed some light on that, please? Director Spagnol. Thank you, Marilyn. Through you to Councillor Ritchie. Uh, as part of the first phase of the, uh, the official plan project, uh, there was visioning sessions, uh, there was a public open house. As part of the second phase, there will be opportunity for more comments to be received from the public and stakeholders 
and also from council prior to the finalization or drafting of any official plan policy. So that will be included in the work plan that will be on a subsequent report to council later on this month. Okay, moving on to county updates. Deputy Mayor Coughlin. Uh, thank you, Marilyn. I was actually absent from the last county. I do have the updates here, but I wasn't sure if Councillor Cabral had a, oh, sorry. a two page Councilor written Cabral, it slipped my update mind. Yes. for us. Good. <laughs> Um, at the county council. Um, most of it was, uh, a, a lot of, be honest with you, it was um, housekeeping with uh, qu quarterly reports for year ends and that. But um, some things that I thought were quite uh, uh, noteworthy were, in particular, the museum and the archives. Um, with their programs that they've been running the last year, they had a very significant jump in visitors. Um, they jumped from 15,000 in uh, through 2018 to just shy of 21,000 visitors through 2019. So whatever it is that they're doing, they're doing it well. And I know they've run a number of programs uh, the past year, but uh, that's a very significant jump. Uh, in health and uh, emergency services, uh, County of Simcoe Paramedic Services uh, did receive funds from the Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care to establish a dedicated off-nurse <coughs> off Memorandum of Understanding uh, and Program at Royal Victoria Regional Health Centre. And I think what this is uh, designed to do is designed to get the paramedics back out on the road as quickly as possible by having someone in place. And they managed to get the same uh, funding to do it again for 2019 and 2020. And it remains at the same level as 2018-19. Uh, also, when it came to county long-term uh, long care home stays, they also had uh, uh, short-stay respite beds approved for 2020 again at each of the uh, four county long-term uh, care homes. Um, they applied for it, uh, for these uh, beds through the local health integration network, and uh, they were approved for 2020, which was good news. Um, uh, another thing that struck me was... Uh, gets down to waste management, in particular was the curbside battery collection that we uh, had this past fall, the county did it. It was the sixth annual curbside battery collection of single-use batteries, and uh, it occurred the uh, week of November the 4th to the 8th, and the amount of program batteries collected this year increased by 9.8% over the previous year, and the tonnage exceeded all other uh, Ontario municipalities, which uh, was pretty remarkable considering some of the other municipalities that we were uh, compared to were, were ones like uh, regions of Peel, Durham, and Niagara. So uh, we, uh, we've uh, continually improved with the 2019 tonnage being 57.9% higher than back in 2014. So that's a, a great increase. So uh, the people in Simcoe County are certainly... Uh, setting their single-use batteries aside and, uh, and getting rid of them the right way. Uh, the other thing that was good news, I think, was uh, a Lynx um, public transit service began in September. This is Lynx Plus. It's not the regular Lynx service. What this service does is it uh, uh, provides uh, an opportunity for those that uh, have difficulty or mobility issues and, and can't get to the bus on their own um, to uh, actually call up uh, a service that will bring them to a location where they can catch the bus. And what they've done is they've expanded it this year because it was only to within 400 meters of where the regular transit route existed. And this year, Simcoe County's uh, gonna try a pilot project to make it more accessible to those folks living in rural communities out in the country that they'll exceed that 400 meters up to a kilometer or two to get those people, uh, enable them to catch the bus. Um, and the last thing that came up that I thought uh, maybe the mayor like to speak to is uh, the, the waste management transfer stations and the way the trucks are going to operate. Certainly. Thank um, you. Thank you for that uh, report summary. Um, yes, uh, with the new uh, garbage collection uh, uh, schedule, which starts this week, so uh, everybody's uh, putting out the right things and the right time. Uh, for us, it's garbage and green bin for our collection days this week um, the county realizes that now that they are collecting garbage and recycling every other week the um, buildup of uh, on the trucks um, necessitates 
uh, a, a greater uh, frequency of drop-off in the materials management facilities. So therefore, instead of having one material management facility to aggregate the recycle and the garbage for Simcoe County, they now feel that it is uh, more environmentally friendly and time economic to have four sites to aggregate the materials management and recycling. And so in addition to the Environmental Resource Recovery Center materials management facility portion up on Horseshoe Valley Road that they propose to do, <coughs> excuse me, they are proposing three other locations on existing county um, landfill sites where, they're, where they do waste management presently, one up north, one uh, and, and two others uh, throughout uh, Simcoe County, such that there will be a total of four. And uh, they want to uh, proceed with planning and hopefully uh, getting finalization and, build and adding on to the existing sites the, the facility that would be required to do this in the first two of those four sites in Simcoe County by the time the uh, renegotiation of the waste management contract for recyclables happens in November of 2021. So there was considerable discussion about that and basically counts, County Council gave authorization to staff to go ahead uh, to do the detailed study with respect to cost timing and uh, and what it would look like to uh, to have that happen. Councillor Hanna? Uh, thank you for that update. So, if I understand this, will they be built structures where they'll be dumping the garbage off and then they'll be come back in and taking it out of there and reloading it and trucking it away again? And will that not be more expensive than it would have been if we'd have continued with garbage pickup every week instead of every other week? Um, it will be uh, m many facilities or four facilities that will be doing what the materials management facility would have been doing at the Environmental Resource Recovery Center. Taking the, the trucks and, and uh, having them dump the garbage, dump the recycle, and aggregating that, and uh, crushing it, uh, um, compressing it, and then trans transferring that to where, where they're being processed. Um, the, it did come up about the cost of the, of the uh, structures that they're proposing on the, on the other three sites. Uh, the question came up, does that mean there's going to be a three-quarter, 75% reduction for what's going to happen at the Environmental Resource Recovery Center on Horseshoe Valley Road with respect to materials management? And uh, the question did come up about uh, cost-benefit of this versus continuing with our existing methods that we do, all of which um, staff have to come back to County Council with more specifics. Uh, thank you. I appreciate that. So if it comes back that it is more, <coughs> would you then be in a position to go back to garbage pickups yes. every week? No, no, no. We'd be in a position to consider um, uh, renegotiating a contract that didn't involve the other three sites. I, I don't think you're going to see garbage going back to what we've just finished. I, uh, but that said, the, the present changes to the waste management are for the remainder of this, this uh, waste management contract. We still have to do an updated workshop with respect to updating the waste management strategy going beyond that. And that's going to involve looking at many things, including now the present collection process um, schedule, as well as the potential of mechanization uh, and all sorts of other things vis-a-vis -vis waste management as we continue to grow and go forward. Very costly exercise. Councillor Cabral. Thanks, Mayor Allen. Actually, actually um, the Environmental Resource Recovery Center, is that, that's not for all recyclables. That's supposed to be just for organics. No. That, so it's, uh, th that'll be a, a transfer station as well as yes. an organic. Okay, thank the, you. Just to remind people, the Environmental Resource Recovery Center is a combination of two things. It's a materials management processing facility to aggregate recyclable and garbage. 
and it's, it's an organics processing plant, two separate things. Okay. Deputy Mayor Cogler. Uh, thank you, Marilyn, and, and through you at, at your discretion, I was also hoping to speak to the uh, session we attended with Minister York. Sure. Uh, for council and, and public's benefit, uh, there was an invitation extended from Minister Yurik and MPP Cajun uh, to attend a roundtable session uh, last Friday. Yes. I think. <laughs> uh, whereas local, um, in, so there was Ducks Unlimited, Conservation on Ontario, uh, different authority uh, and different dignitaries. And it was quite interesting because they, they, they created the table. So you were assigned to a table when you got there. And it was interesting because it, it was almost like all the perspectives were placed at a table together, whereas people, when we attend these, usually sit in their own pockets. Uh, I believe that this facilitated some incredible discussion. And in everything that event, it was definitely one of the most engaging and uh, informative sessions I have attended to date. Um, so I would like to thank Minister Yurik and, and Cajun for the Cajun, sorry, for the opportunity to do so. And I do look forward to the report that comes from that because there was a wealth of knowledge in the room uh, from various uh, groups and uh, for instance at our table we had the CFO of uh, Toronto CA and we had Lake Simcoe CA and the NVCA and ourselves and it was it was just very informative to see um, how different aspects of the changes coming forward to the Conservation Authorities Act or sorry the Conservation Act could look like in the near future. Yeah. I would concur with that the um, the tables and how many people do you think would have been there? 120? Yep. Um, and this was one of three or four, two, two, now two, now two uh, that uh, are going to happen in Ontario. Uh, they had a, the ministry had a facilitator at each table, madly typing uh, comments, questions, and <coughs> concerns. And the questions that they gave us and points of discussion really, really were on point and really generated discussion pretty quickly. So it was very time efficient. I've been describing it to people as the most most respectful disagreement I've ever been part of because it was just it was just so many different sides and everybody with the same end goal trying to get there and it was just incredible to be part of. So it was it was great. Okay. Thank you. Next we move on to item twelve which is notice of motion. Oh sorry, municipal updates, I missed them. Uh, Councillor Ritchie. Um, I just wanted to mention back in January, the uh, Phelpston Rec Committee had their uh, snow pitch. And uh, there were three or four teams that uh, they pitched the ball out in the snow all afternoon and, and they used the pavilion there. And they had uh, big crock pots of uh, hot soup and it, it was a real good time. And I, and I want to thank uh, the director, our new director of Parks and Rec for helping us out and getting the snow plows in there to move the snow out of the way. And so it was a good time had by all. So, so thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, <coughs> Councillor Chapman. Thank you, Mayor Allen. Um, as most people know, our min the Minnesing Mini Fest is this weekend, Friday and Saturday, 7th and 8th. Um, it is very exciting. The theme is the Roaring Twenties. So I'm excited to see everyone's costume. Um, Friday night's bowling, it's full, euchre, and then uh, family skate, and we have ice, so which is awesome. Um, Saturday's uh, pancake breakfast at Pimo, and some of our dignitaries will be uh, serving our pancakes, so come out and chat with them. Um, and that would be Mayor Allen and Doug Shripley is coming out. Um, plus we'll have our Citizen and Youth of the Year during pancake breakfast our coloring contest, a bookmark, which is presented by the Springwater uh, Library, um, our magician, our parade, which we have six led by our fire department, and they are also um, giving Swampy a ride for half of it because it's too far for him to walk, so thank you to, the, to them. Um, we have our magician in the afternoon, our chili cook-off. If anyone wants to make a pot of chili, we're looking for a couple more. I did put one in, so hopefully I beat my husband. And we have a speakeasy. And then at the end, um, dance followed by county line. All details are on Facebook, a flyer, and the Springwater News. 
And the buttons are at Chico's Library and the Four Cedar Store, and that's what Jenny and I, Counselor uh, Coglin, I have on. Second, um, for the rink house, we have put on our Facebook page a little blurb where if it, the rink house is open or closed. So if people in the township is unsure of the menacing rink to be open, if they click on the Facebook page, we will put if it's open or closed, and that way they, they are notified. And that's to uh, Mike Priest who thought of that. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Any other municipal updates? Okay, uh, next we move on to item 12.1, and that's a notice of motion by Councillor Hanna. Is there a seconder to that notice of motion? Okay, Councillor Moore. Before I turn it over to you, Councillor Hanna, I'll just read it. Whereas Council passed a bylaw 219-033 to adopt code of conduct for members of Council and local boards, and whereas section 4.3 of the code of conduct for members of council states that council can terminate the integrity commissioner only by a two-thirds vote of all members, be it resolved that council hereby desires to remove section 4.3 of the code of conduct for members of council and further that a bylaw be presented for consideration um, of council just changing some words here because we're going to be considering it tonight uh, to amend the code of conduct accordingly. Okay, uh, Councillor Hanna. Uh, thank you, Mayor. And I think it's reasonably self-explanatory, but I think the important thing that we all have to recognize is that this contractor, when they provided us the code of conduct, inserted this restriction in there that requires six out of seven of the members of this council to vote unanimously in order to remove them as our contractor. Um, and everybody has to be present at council in order to uh, achieve that. So I'm suggesting that we should go with the constitution, if you like, or, or democracy where the majority makes a decision and not uh, six out of seven. Deputy Mayor Coughlin. Uh, thank you, Marilyn. And further to discussion uh, with, with Councillor Hannah and staff and other members of council, uh, at first my instinct was to think that our council had found a loophole and we were trying to change something with a majority vote to get rid of a major majority vote. Um, but I do agree that all the work that we do, all the contractors that we hire, any subcontractor or any RFP that goes out, um, that's by vote or resolution of council and that requires four. So our engineers are hired by four, our everything else is hired by four and I think that I think that th that makes it consistent. Um, in speaking with Councillor Hanna and to the discretion of staff this evening, I would also like to get more information about other uh, forms of integrity commissioners. Um, I do understand that this is a massive undertaking and I, it's, it's, it's not something I want to put at the top priority, but I am very curious. We've been doing a lot of work. Um, it did take three years to get a code of conduct in place. Uh, it was through the county that we uh, we're led to principles integrity and uh, this is very new for municipalities in Ontario as it's, it's new legislation so um, I do think that we we should at least look at options that are out there um, to see because I'm still not able to to fully understand how we're billed um, and, and that concerns me um, I, I've I don't want to go out to tender necessarily right away. I don't know if even just looking at, I, I, from what I understand, in talking with colleagues, um, other heads of council have the same concern um, in that principal's integrity is primarily that in Simcoe County and we're not necessarily <coughs> sure how, how things happen. So um, I don't know if uh, through you to, to Clerk Shaft, oh, to Clerk Ainsworth, sorry about that. Uh, if you would like an amendment to this or just an item for future consideration or a notice of motion on the next agenda. But I do think that we need to continue to move forward with this because uh, I too have questions about it. Clerk. Uh, thank you. Uh, it would be up to you to, if you would like to make an amendment to this motion or you could submit a, an item for fu future consideration to outline exactly what uh, you would be looking for in a future report. Okay, thank you. Deputy Mayor Coughlin? It'll be a future IFC. Okay. All right. Any other questions, comments? 
Okay. So um, then, uh, all those in favor? Opposed? It's carried. Any other uh, notices of motion? <laughs> Surprise. <laughs> The notice of motion would be regarding uh, possible alternatives or other options for Anna, our integrity commissioner. Okay. Just give the clerk a chance to. You got that? Uh, Councillor Hannah. Uh, thank you. Uh, my notice of motion is in relation to the report that came forward on, earlier on the uh, council meeting to do with the. Um, Heritage Committee report. My notice of motion is that the Heritage Committee consider adding the Mithras Community Hall to the Heritage Registry of Properties as having cultural heritage value and interest to the community. Okay. Anything else? Councillor Cabral? No, we don't speak to them now. They just get them. Okay. Yeah, it'll be on the next agenda, and we'll speak to it then. Okay, moving on to 13.1 uh, items for future consideration. Any items for future consideration? Councillor Hanna? Thank you, and I appreciate everybody's patience. Um, my concern is, I guess, if, if Council supports the staff looking into this, otherwise I'll just disregard it. But uh, we received uh, uh, information from Council a week ago suggesting or telling us that a uh, a uh, tree cutting and a, and a uh, uh, open burn was taking place for the development in the Hillsdale area. I totally support that development and I don't want that to be misconstrued. I totally support that development. My question is relation to tree cutting because we do not have a township tree cutting bylaw. We rely on the county's bylaw and, and I think I'd appreciate feedback from staff on that tonight and also um, our burning uh, policy, I don't believe we have a bylaw, our burning policy is people request an opportunity to burn and we pass it on to our fire service. So my question or for future consideration, should we be considering a township tree cutting bylaw? Council asked for one, or I asked for one several years ago. Staff brought it forward and the council today voted against it. Uh, so if this council is of the same mind, then we should just disregard that request. But do we need to consider a tree uh, or, or an open burning policy, given the fact right now that there's a lot of concern about global warming and uh, impacts on the environment? So that's, that's just my items for future consideration. And if the rest of the council wants to support it, we'll get staff to work on it. If not, we can just disregard it now and staff doesn't have to be bothered. Okay. Um, I'll go to the clerk first and then uh, CAO uh, Schmidt to have a comment on that, please. Uh, thank you. In regards to any uh, tree clearing bylaw, staff are currently looking um, at um, at that issue, and something will be coming forward to council in the future. Um, as far as the burn bylaw, uh, I believe Deputy um, <coughs> Chief French may be able to comment on that. Deputy Chief Jeff French, welcome. Thank you, Mayor Ellen, to Councillor Hanna. Um, we do have an open air burning bylaw. Uh, there is three types of permits. There's your regular rec recreational permit. We do have an open air burn permit, uh, which most farmers do use. And we do have a, uh, a large uh, lot clearing permit, which is a little more uh, money to purchase, but we do have that. As far as the global warming and all that, you, that you talk about that. Um, I think it would probably balance out equally because the time you bring your saws in, your wood chippers in, and then you're going to have to have trucks on site to haul that away. Um, because if not, uh, Councillor Ma can attest to this that uh, she had a little pile going in her backyard in the schoolyard started smoldering. So um, it's probably just easier just to burn it. Uh, we have been out to inspect it and been on site a couple of times just to make sure everything is going well and. Everything seems to be burning fine, so. <coughs> Councillor Hanna. Uh, thank you, Deputy Chief, and I, I appreciate that, but I guess what I understand is our current bylaw is that 
if somebody wants to have an opening burn, they get a permit. And if it's a bigger burn, they get a different permit. But we really don't have a policy to do with um, tree cutting, uh, uh, whatever you call it, uh, when a development takes place uh, to come in and, and uh, cut and burn and so on. We really don't have a policy with that. And, and I think that that behooves us probably to have some restrictions or some type of policy other than the fact that you just get a permit and it either gets approved or doesn't get approved. And I, I would respectfully suggest that's not any restriction. That's just a, a permit to go ahead and do it. So again, if the rest of the council doesn't feel that's necessary, then don't worry about it. Okay, um, Director CAO Schmidt, did you have any thoughts with respect to that? No? Okay. Councillor Cabral? Thank you, Marilyn. Just on that, regarding permits, um, I get a permit every year. If I burn without one, I'm going to be penalized for it. Uh, if a, a farmer needs to get a permit from the fire department and he's denied that permit, then he is breaking uh, township by burning without a permit. So I, I think the restriction actually does already exist, is, right. is all I'm trying to say. Right. Um, Deputy Mayor Coughlin. Uh, thank you, Marilyn. Um, through you to, to members of council and, and staff, uh, the work we're doing right now with the regional governance review and all the discussion out there is, is streamlining process and removing red tape. So my concern with the municipality then having a bylaw, is it is it more control? Is it what would what would be the purpose? If, if there's already a bylaw in existence, and to me, I don't know what what the complaints are about the counties. If, if the municipality had a tree cutting bylaw as well, are we duplicating the process or are we adding additional services or how, what is the benefit to that? So before, why are we asking for this is, is basically what I'm asking for. Okay, um, Director Spagnol, I know that uh, you've dealt with this from a planning perspective, uh, certainly with the Curry property and, and with this uh, Western Mechanical property that we're, we're, uh, is, is ongoing now, maybe you could You've dealt with MVCA, you've dealt with county. Maybe you could give us your thoughts with respect to this, please. Thank you, Marilyn. I think the, really the, to Deputy Mayor Coughlin's comment, I think the layer of uh, governmental involvement in various permits is what causes an inefficiency in dealing with those types of applications. And what we've seen over the course of, I would say, the last three or four years is um, some uncertainty and I would say some confusion as to how the county's current tree conservation bylaw is applied, mostly with respect to properties that are located within settlement areas, um, also with respect to properties that may require subsequent planning approvals. So my understanding of the county street conservation bylaw is that it was drafted to consider large agricultural lots where you might have clearing to ensure that there wouldn't be any environmental lands cleared or any sensitive lands cleared. But what's happening now with more development happening in settlement areas where there isn't a local tree clearing bylaw to refer to, that there's some uncertainty as to how those types of situations are to be dealt with when you might have some planning approvals that might dictate how properties are to be developed and, and what site preparation needs to go into those properties. So really there, there's, there's some uncertainty as to how that conservation bylaw is to be applied within municipalities and, and specifically in, within settlement areas. Follow on? Yes, and, and I guess my apologies for the jest, but wouldn't it just be simpler then to learn and understand that rather than developing our own? And, and I'm not trying to be facetious in any way. I just, if, it, if it's just clarity that we're looking for, maybe we should seek that clarity before enacting on a bylaw of our own. Director Spagnol. Thank you, Mayor Allen. Three to, to, to Deputy Mayor Coughlin. That's a great point. Um, I think the, the real issue is the administration of the tree conservation bylaw at the various levels and consistency in the administration of that bylaw. So I, I'm not disagreeing with you that the, the confusion may not necessarily be associated with uh, 
with how the bylaw is written. The bylaw may be outdated at the county level, which may assist. However, it's it's in the it's in the administration of that bylaw which is causing the confusion. I would say at at, at the local level here. But for the two recent examples that I just stated, the Curries and the and the Western Mechanical, uh, in conjunction with the NBCA and the county, uh, we're able to work through it and and uh, and and get pretty expeditious results. Is that correct, Director Spagnol? Mayor Allen, I, I would agree that the reviews that, that took place were similar and that the NVCA was consulted. There was recommendations that were done through that process. However, the communication that went back and forth between county representatives and township representatives was different, slightly different for, most, for both processes, right. which is what the root of the, 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 the confusion really rests with. Yeah. So it was the same reviews, the same process outline. But the application of the, the tree conservation bylaw at the county level, there was differences in, in how they were treated. For what I would for what I would say were two identical situations. So that just requires uh, communicating with the county to get a standardized um, interpretation uh, that we can count on with respect to this rather than putting another layer of a bylaw and red tape uh, in the mix. Is that is that what I'm hearing? Uh, Mayor Allen, I think it's really, it would really be an acknowledgement by the county, an agreement by the county to have to revise their county bylaw to reflect the individual situations that we're talking about within the settlement areas because they have actually said that their conservation bylaw was not drafted to deal with site prep within settlement areas. So it would really have to be a county agreeing to revise their conservation, tree conservation bylaw to reflect the issues that we're dealing with. They're not issues, but the considerations we're dealing with because staff have had those discussions with representatives from the county. Well, I would certainly support uh, assisting in, in trying to get that happening at the county level. Deputy Mayor Coughlin. And, and thank you, and, and my comment was gonna be similar then um, with, with the initiative from Councillor Hanna. If this, op if this opportunity exists before we create another layer, then let's, as a council, send a, a message even more directly than just through us as in the form of a letter saying we want this done and we want to see it happen because these questions and it needs to, we need to have answers for our residents so we can have that done. Okay, uh, so clerk, what do you need from us to, uh, to create that? Uh, Councillor Cabral? Thank you, Marilyn. Actually, a question for uh, Director Spagnol. Um, I'm just curious. I think this may have happened in the past, but um, uh, these situations where developers or Western Mechanical uh, are doing some clear cutting in order to uh, prepare the site, uh, given the nature of the trees that are there, is there opportunity or has there been opportunity in the past for uh, a firm like uh, Ritchie's Forest? products, do they not occasionally go in and, and take trees that would be of value? Um, Director Spagnol, um, uh, and I'll just, uh, I'll just add to a bit of information. Uh, CEO Schmidt and myself went and toured the property uh, yesterday to see, uh, see what was happening. And we were told that the um, area had been for is in the process of being forested uh, for, uh, and, and there have been sales and trees identified for, for sales uh, that, that are marketable. And the, the brush and trees that are, are being cleared are not, are not mar marketable. Okay, I think that answered the Councillor Brown's question. Okay, uh, Clerk Ainsworth. Uh, thank you. Uh, Councillor Hanna has advised that he does not want this to be an official uh, item for future consideration. Uh, and in speaking with Deputy Mayor Coughlin, we will work on wording for an IFC at a future meeting. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, moving on to uh, bylaws. Can I have a mover and seconder to Deputy Mayor Coughlin, Councillor Cabral, <clears throat> that the bylaws listed herein be signed and sealed by the Mayor and Clerk, 2020-005, stop and Stop up and close road allowance, Hauler Road, 2020-06. Final completion, Center Vesper Water and Wastewater Treatment Plant, 5303. Remove holding symbol, Iveson, LH 219-007, 5304. 
Zoning bylaw amendment, Alex Curry Motors, ZB 219-011. All those in favor? Carried. And a confirmatory mover and seconder, please. Councillor Moore and Councillor Chapman. That bylaw 220-007 to confirm and adopt the proceedings of council at the regular meeting held on February 5, 220 listed herein be signed and sealed by the mayor and clerk. All those in favor? Carried. And a German, please. Councillor Moore and Deputy Mayor Coughlin. The regular meeting of the Township of Springwater does now adjourn at 8.07 p.m. to meet again in a regular meeting on February 19, 2020 at 6.30 p.m. in the Council Chambers, Admin Centre, Minnesing. All those in favour? Carried.